bag. The perfect summer treat since the school year is ending and hot weather is all over the place outside which will make eating ice cream outside that much sweeter. So you guys are going to enjoy this. It's actually very easy to do. All you guys need is ice, uh, heavy cream or half and half. Your parents know what I mean. I'm going to use heavy cream, vanilla, sugar, and rock salt. Now, if anyone has any dairy allergies, you might ask your parents if you guys can find um, an alternative to cream or maybe a dairy-free something, um, something you guys can use instead. Uh, but this is the ingredients we're going to be using. You will also need a gallon size bag. And I'm using a normal size sandwich baggie. The recipe actually calls for a quarter size bag. I don't have one. Uh, this will be plenty big enough for our for the ice cream in a baggie, so it's probably fine. Uh, but quarter size bag, normal baggie, whatever. Before we get to that, though, of course, we've got to talk about ice cream. And we've got to talk about uh, temperature and states of matter and all these things. It'll be a really fun thing. Uh, but I have a question. Who invented ice cream? Well, ice cream was actually, uh, no one's ever, well, we don't actually know who invented ice cream. It's been around for centuries, so we don't know who actually started it. But a guy named uh, Augustus Jackson, who was an African-American in the 1800s, he is known as the father of modern ice cream. He was the White House chef for several years, and he uh, took what we know as ice cream, and he decided to play around with a little tiger, my cat is apparently wants to ice, wants to ice as well. Um, but he took what we know as ice cream and he decided to have some fun with the ice cream. And he created a lot of the modern uh, flavors that we still use and we still enjoy today. So when he, uh, so when he quit his um, job as White House chef several years later, he went into business himself and he created ice cream and he sold that ice cream to all the different um, ice cream parlors in the area and became extremely famous and one of the wealthiest African Americans ever. So as we're enjoying our treat today and as we are talking about the science behind ice cream, make sure you guys are thanking Augustus Jackson for this wonderful, wonderful treat that we now have. All right, so ice cream. I will show you guys a picture of Augustus Jackson, but he also didn't like he also didn't like the camera, so we don't really have any pictures of him, unfortunately. But um, ice cream is cold, right? Well, how do we know what something is hot, and how do we know what something is cold? We know it by the temperature. Now, the word temperature is kind of confusing in science because a lot of people, when they say the word temperature, they're referring to the hotness or the coldness of that object. But in physics. Things aren't really necessarily categorized by how hot or by how cold it is. In physics, instead, objects are categorized by how much kinetic energy um, a, an object has and how much potential energy an object has. So what do I mean? Well, potential energy are, is objects that have stored up energy. So imagine a ball at the top of a hill. It's not moving. It's not going to where it's just sitting there. Well, believe it or not, that object is actually storing up energy so that when you kick the ball down the hill, or when you roll the ball, or bounce the ball down the hill, that object will do what you're wanting it to do. Kinetic energy is objects in motion. So that ball that's at the top of the hill, it has potential energy when it's just sitting there not doing anything. But the moment you bounce that ball down the hill and it goes flying away, that ball is now using kinetic energy. It's using all of that potential energy and it's turning that kinetic energy and it's going cray cray. Okay, so like, it's like you go to sleep at night, okay? You're sleeping in bed, you're not doing anything, you're sleeping. And the next morning, you're restful and you're energized so you can, so you can jump out of bed and go throughout your day. You can use all the energy that your body stored up at night time. Make a little sense? Okay, so in physics, hot objects are actually objects where the particles um, have all kinds of, of, of kinetic energy and cold objects are actually the objects where the particles aren't moving very fast but has more potential energy. So let's break this down a little bit more. In our world, our world is made up of particles. The table and chair that you sit at your house to do your schoolwork or to eat meals, 
bats made of particles, your bed is made of particles, your body is made of particles, the food you eat is made of particles. Literally, if particles didn't exist, our world could not exist. So in objects where those particles are moving like crazy, um, then that is a hotter object because those particles have more kinetic energy. So let's say you know, you're boiling water on a stove and the boiling is popping and bubbles are going everywhere and you have steam rising from, from the pot. Well, that pot, it has the, art, the, the particles in that, in that water is going crazy and so it has more kinetic energy and so that is why that, though, that water is hot. But in ice, like I have here, it's colder because the particles aren't really moving. They're, they might be moving some, but they're not moving a lot. And so, or that they are, it's moving very, very slowly. And so they have more potential energy. And so that means that that object is colder, okay? But I have a question. What about the chair that you're probably sitting in right now or the table where you're doing your schoolwork or your bed? It doesn't feel hot or cold. It definitely doesn't go anywhere. So what is it? Well, solid objects, because they're not going anywhere, because those particles are staying right there, then those particles would be technically have more potential energy, so they technically, technically be classified as colder in physics because they're not going anywhere. If the particles in your chair were going places, the moment you try to sit down in that chair, that chair would fall apart because it couldn't withstand your weight. So, and, and on solid objects on this table here, the objects are the particles are staying put in order so that they can so this so it can hold our stuff and it's probably is classified as more of a colder object in physics. Okay? Make sense? Alright. Well also in our world when we say the word temperature, we also are referring to weather. So um, a lot of times, well not a lot of times, but it's actually true, um, in our world we define temperature by three different types of degree. We have Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. Fahrenheit we use here in the United States of America and maybe one or two other countries in the world, I'm not actually sure, but pretty much every other country in the world uses Celsius. Americans just like to be different and so we're using Fahrenheit pretty much. Um, but Fahrenheit, our freezing point, which means the point where objects have to freeze, is 32 degrees. Okay, usually if it's winter time and you see the weather guy um, on the television saying it's going to be in the 20s with a high of 31, 32 degrees. That's really fantastic because we might get snow and you might have, you might get a day off school, which is awesome. Okay. Our boiling point or the temperature where objects are to boil is 212 degrees. Thankfully, we don't have anything. And thankfully, our summers don't get that high because that would be really, really hot. And Celsius, which like I said, is used pretty much everywhere else in the world, the freezing point is zero. So zero is where objects are to freeze and their boiling point is 100. So wait, how can a bunch of different countries use Celsius and have a totally different temperature system and we use Fahrenheit and we have a different temperature, like how does that work? Well, Fahrenheit and Celsius actually measure temperature differently but we'll just disregard all the scientific things that go into measuring temperature differently. But the hour 32 degrees is the same thing as Celsius is zero degrees. And hour 212 boiling point degrees is the same thing as Celsius 100 degrees. Okay? Um, the last type of temperature that is used in the world is called Kelvin. And that's usually only used by scientists. Um, so like they'll say something is 87 Kelvin instead of 87 degrees. Uh, fun fact, in, 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 in science, scientists actually figured out what the absolute zero is, which is the absolute zero is the coldest an object can possibly get. And the absolute zero is minus 273 degrees, 73.15 degrees Celsius or minus 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that is stinking cold. Humans can't survive in that cold of temperature, first of all, okay? And when objects get that cold, they start to do really weird things. 
I really encourage you guys to look this up on the internet because this is it's really cool and it's really weird how things do like like helium, which is usually used to blow balloons up at birthday parties. When helium gets to be gets down to to absolute zero, which is that that, that freezing point, the coldest it can possibly get. It actually starts to work against gravity. So, like you know, gravity holds us, pushes us down, and holds us on Earth. Well, helium will be like, no, I'm too cold for that. I'm gonna start rising and working against gravity and going up into the air. It's actually really cool. I really encourage you guys to look it up if you if you have a chance to. Um, so we can actually change the way temperature is impacted. Uh, with different objects and we're going to see that with our ice cream okay so we it's kind of you can you learn this early in school where where temperature has three different states of matter we know we have gas we have liquid and we have solid we have a gas which is like the steam over the pot of boiling water we have liquid which is water and we have a solid which is ice okay and you can always melt the ice and it can turn to water or you can put it on the stove top and it can turn to a boiling point. You can go backwards and it can go from a steam to a liquid to a solid, okay? Well, we're gonna put salt in ice cream. And if you guys ever have a ice cream maker at home, you'll notice that your parents also put salt in their ice cream maker. Why do they put salt in the ice cream maker? Well, because when we put salt on the ice cream or on the ice, it changes the freezing point. So we know that in Fahrenheit, which is the temperature we use here in America, our freezing point is 32 degrees. It's usually when something starts to freeze. When we put ice, that freezing point is lower, so that it's now 27, 28 degrees. Now you think that wouldn't be that big of a deal. Like what, 27, 28 degrees is only four or five degrees lower than 32. It's actually a huge deal. Like if it's winter time, well, when it, whenever it's going to be winter time again, and you hear in the weather channel that the weather is going to be like the mid 20s, like super low 30s, like, you know, the high like 32 degrees. Or, you know, remember like back in February, February when we had the big freezing rain, like the high was like 33 degrees or whatever. That is, we everyone put salt on the roads and on, the, on our porches and on our stairs and sidewalks and everything like that because that would mean that it would take longer for the ice to freeze on the roads before it gets dangerous because the weather has to get down to 27, 28 degrees before the ice on the roads could freeze thanks to the salt. So four or five degrees may seem like not that big of a deal, but it's actually a big deal because it could mean the difference between being able to still drive home safely from school or from work or wherever versus being stuck wherever you are because the roads are too icy. And we're gonna do the same thing here. When we put ice in our ice cream machine, in our, in our, in our baggie and in your homemade um, ice cream maker, it's going to stop the material, it's gonna stop all the liquids from turning into solid. It's going to let them thicken up into a nice, really thick, creamy, creamy mixture, mixture. And so you actually can eat actual cream and not a popsicle, okay? So that was kind of a fast lesson with um, temperature and kinetic energy, potential energy, but I figured that you guys would be more interested in the ice cream part of this lesson, so we're gonna go ahead and get to it, okay? For this ice cream lesson, First thing is, we're going to put our gallon size bag aside. And I'm going to take my sugar here. I'm going to put in two tablespoons of sugar. I'm going to make sure this is on the placemat here. So two tablespoons of sugar in this baggie. Right there. I think my tiger wants to join us here in a second, guys. So tiger might show her face again. She's looking very interested as what I'm doing on the table. Let me open up my heavy cream. And I want a whole cup of cream. See if I can pour it in here without making too much of a mess. Ah, yep, I'm making too much of a mess. Okay, let me try this different way. Okay, 
right, we're just gonna make a huge bit of mess with the sucker, but that is okay. Because what's ice cream without a mess, right? All right, if you'll give me guys, if you'll give you guys, if you give me a second to wash my hands off and to clean up my mess, I'll be back with you guys in a second. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I highly encourage you guys to do this project with someone who can hold the baggie open for you. That will make it a lot easier without less with less mess, which your parents will appreciate. Um, our, our last ingredient is going to be half a teaspoon of vanilla. So, as you can see, this is a very oops. You can mess too. Okay. This is a very easy recipe to do. So, let's go ahead and close this up. You want to get all the air out of this baggie, but you want to be careful because there is liquid inside here, and you do not want the liquid to go everywhere. So you want to get the air out, okay? We're going to stick this into our giant bag, just like this. Also, you don't want all the mixture to come out you want to stay in the baggie so that it will actually make ice cream and you won't have just two bags full of just stuff. Let me close up my vanilla real quick. Next, we are going to fill this bag with ice. My recipe says three cups of ice. You guys, your parents can eyeball how much ice you need. But you just need to have a bunch of ice in here. I think I've done this before with less ice. Three cups is just, you know, you want, you want to be covered with ice because it needs to be cold. Okay. Next and last but not least, we are going to put a fourth cup of rock salt on top. Once again, the rock salt is going to keep our ice cream mixture as an ice cream and not turn it into a solid, which is what we want. So, one fourth cup of rock salt. Sprinkle right on top. And here is the fun part. Once again, get all the air out of the baggie. You are now going to shake this bag for seven to 10 minutes.
with gloves because my fingers are frozen, even with gloves on. Also, um, there is water a lot of places just from the back, so you might as well mind it's outside. Thankfully, it is warm enough now, so you guys can do this, that can do this outside. Um, it might also help your parents not get on their nerves from shaking the bag for 10 minutes. But, sugar bag, you might be able to feel your mixture kind of getting a hard, hard little bit in there. That's a good thing. That means it's doing what I want to do. Now, let's get in there. Let's get our bag out. Yes, and you can feel that it's nice and thick and creamy. So all that's left is to open our baggie and to enjoy it with your favorite ice cream toppings. So let's all say thank you again to Augustus Jackson for inventing um, modern ice cream for us so that we can enjoy ice cream in a bag on a hot summer day. So I'll see you guys later. Enjoy your ice cream, guys. Bye.